Let's all stand. You're not going to stand? I know she can't stand. You don't have to stand. Hallelujah. It's great to be here tonight. Every person here, it is a divine appointment as we come together because God's got a word for every one of us here in this room. He wants to speak right to us individually. And we need to have open hearts and listening ears, right? Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let God speak to us through his word. And uh, hopefully you're not a stumbling block. A lot of different areas that we could be stumbling blocks to other people. And uh, we don't want to have a millstone tied around our neck and thrown into the sea. So this is a great story great sermon for every one of us every one of us here in this room some people say steve says it oh it's not for me <laughs> I, I, I don't i don't need this I didn't say that. <laughs> but it's for every one of us here so let's pray lord jesus thank you we can come together as the body of christ thank you for this room that you provided lord may your glory fill this place yeah. May we know the presence of the living God right here tonight. Lord, if any of us have been involved in any type of sin, that you would come and and convict us of that sin, Lord, that we would repent and turn back to you tonight. God, you want to have fellowship with us, all of us here in this room. You want to have fellowship with us, all those watching online. God, and um, I pray that nothing would be keeping us from that fellowship with you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the musicians that are here that gave up their time and got here early and were practicing and getting ready to serve you. Thank you for the ushers, Lord, that got here early, set things up. Thank you for the sound people, Lord. Thank you for our Sunday school teachers on Sunday mornings, God. What a what a great blessing it is to be part of your family, Lord. Fill us with your spirit tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. into the presence of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And guess what? And he shall live. Isn't that great? Higher and higher and Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Higher and higher and he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome Self in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And guess what will happen? And he shall lift you up higher and higher.
is the life of the party around here. Amen. Everything the world has to offer is phony baloney. But Jesus is an open door to eternal life. Amen. 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 Come on into the presence of the Lord. Worship. 
worship. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. Bye. 
Amen. It's all about Jesus, right? So I want you, uh, we'll turn on the lights, and I want you just to see someone around you um, or behind you and uh, tell them one thing that God has taught you, one thing that God's teaching you this last week, and just share that with the person around you. All right, we're going to receive the tithes and offerings that the Lord has blessed you with that you'd give unto him. Um, he deserves all the honor and the glory and the praise, and he says you're going to reap what you sow. So uh, we'll last week of the month, this is it. Then we start the month of September. So a couple things going on. First of all, uh, Sharon lost her sister this last week to uh, pancreatic cancer, and uh, she's been in stage four for 16 months or around there. So, um, but it just to let you know, just to keep Sharon and Steve and the family in prayer. Thank you. And uh, that God would use them as they go back to uh, the memorial service to be lights, because they're lights, and that they would just shine for you in the midst of that ceremony and friends, family coming together for that funeral service. So keep them in your prayers if you would. And, uh, you know, a lot of things happen every day, every week. And, uh, you know, God says that we can encourage others by the suffering that we've gone through, the trials that we've gone through. Anybody here go through a trial this last week? A few trials, yeah, okay. So <laughs> we have, but the testing of your faith through trials and tribulations causes you to grow. And that you would have patience and more and more patience and, you know, that it would lead to maturity. It would lead to trust in Jesus with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your mind, and all of your strength. And uh, so God's building us. And then with that we could share with others because a lot of people go through same things, you know, and um, we can be good newsers for Jesus. You think this world needs some good newsers? I think so. So uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. And Scott, would you just uh, pray over these tithes and offerings?
Son, to redeem us when we were still sinners, when we were wretches, Lord, you came running after us and you found us and you rescued us on the greatest rescue mission ever. Father, tonight we want to offer you praise and glory that's due your name. Thank you, Lord. Open our eyes, open our ears tonight, and open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us in your Son's most precious name. All right, you may be seated. Take out your weapons. Whoa. Arm yourself. Arm yourself. With the sword of the spirit, take them out. God's living word. And uh, we also need to lift up Maria in prayer. She had uh, foot surgery, right? I mean, Anna. Anna, sorry. Uh, foot surgery, right? Okay, and she's been gone for a couple weeks, and so uh, remember her in prayer as well. And uh, tonight, we've been going through the book of Luke, and we're at Luke chapter 17. I've given you two outlines. One of the outlines had to do with last week, had to do with when people die, what happens. It's a great little outline. It's in the back back there. Uh, you can pick it up after the service or go back and get one. Everybody needs a Bible you don't own one, feel free to take one of those that the body has purchased for you. And we're starting in this chapter, chapter 17. Probably take us a couple weeks to get through it, but <clears throat> the title is, Are You a Stumbling Block to Others? Are you a stumbling I mean, Jesus was really a master with words, and he, his choice of words never fails to grab our attention. He's always grabbing our attention, even tonight. And he, he speaks right to our hearts, you know, about all kinds of different subjects. And the religious leaders, on the other hand, they gave long, boring sermons. Used a lot of different cliches, uh, hypocritical comments. Um, they were very legalistic. And here's Jesus for three years was so refreshing. He was refreshing. He was really revolutionary in his words. And the multitudes responded with this. Very interesting. They said, never did a man speak like this. Never did a man speak like this. And they were amazed at his teaching. And it says that he was on a rescue mission for you and me. Tell the person next to you, God rescued you. He rescued you. 
You know, it says that he came seeking and saving the lost. Seeking and saving the lost. And we were all part of that group. We were all part of the lost. And God came and found us some way, somehow. And so his teaching was with authority. Was with authority. And, uh, you know, well, he was God in human flesh. Of course, it was with authority. Did he know the Bible? Yes, he knew the Bible, right? <laughs> the words of Jesus. And uh, Luke chapter 17 is is strong, powerful, life-changing words. And, uh, you know, I hope that our faith is increased tonight. I hope we draw closer to Jesus. I hope we repent if we need to repent. Rejoice if we need to rejoice. You know, whatever it is that we're going through right now. And so... Strong, powerful words from Jesus, starting in Luke chapter 17. But right at the end of verse, or in ver, chapter Luke chapter 16, Jesus talked about hell, remember? That four-letter word that no one likes to talk about. Hell. And if you weren't here last week, you need to listen to that sermon because there is a real place called hell. And, you know, it was not a place that you want to go to. And the scriptures say you'll reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you will reach, reap corruption. And so we saw some things about hell, about the rich man. What was his name? Remember from last week? Lazarus, not the same one that was raised from the dead. And then a poor man. Oh, the poor man was Lazarus. The rich man, we don't know his name, right? Man, I'm fired up about Luke 17. But uh, so think about it. In hell, there was no Diet Coke, no water in hell, no Coke Zero, no ice, no mercy, no peace, continual torment and anguish. Okay, I, I mean. It was not a place that you wanted to go to. And then there was a chasm fixed, just like there's a chasm right here, between the rich man in Abraham's bosom and, no, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom and the rich man that died. Sorry, you guys over on this side. There was a chasm fixed. And remember, the rich man said, well, send Lazarus over here. Just dip his finger in water so that my tongue... The flame that is in my tongue, you know, that it might give me some rest from that flame. And he says, no, you had your chance when you were here on the earth. You made the choice. And, and so, you know, it's a very interesting study. And this page here talks a lot about that. So you can go back and see that. And, um, you know, right now it says to be absent from the body since Christ's death and resurrection is to be where? Presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. Amen. He descended, it says, into hell. And I think he went to that place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And he preached to those that were waiting for him, the righteous people. And, and then it says he took them up into heaven with him. Hallelujah. And so, you know, we're, we're going to face in the future here, there's going to be the end of time on earth and the final judgment and the eternal punishment in the lake of fire forever and ever. Now, right after this, he comes to Luke chapter 17, verse 1. And he said to his disciples, It is inevitable, inevitable, there we go, that stumbling blocks should come. What's another word for stumbling blocks that some of you have? Offenses? Anybody else have anything else? Jack Phil. <laughs> Jack Phil. <laughs> Ushers, come and get him, will you? Move. <laughs> stumbling blocks. Okay, we'll just call them stumbling blocks. Should come. But woe to him through whom they come. Amen. So he's talking to his disciples here. And uh, 
you know, I was thinking, how can we encourage one another rather than tear down people? How can we really serve one another? You know, how can we really, as Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, think about the interest of others, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regarding one another is more important than themselves. Have this mind in you, Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind in you, which was in who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So how can we avoid being a stumbling block? By what? Not offending others? Okay, the gospel is offensive, it says in the scriptures. People do not like the gospel. But apart from the gospel, how can we stop offending one another, leading people astray, really loving one another, right? And if you love one another, it says you will speak the truth in love. Okay, remember that. So he's going to talk about a millstone. And uh, back in Luke chapter 16, verse 14, <clears throat> Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and what were they doing? Scoffing at him, right? Speaking evil of him, scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, and God knows your hearts. That's just like today. God knows our hearts. You know, he knew where they were coming from. It says it in verse 14. And for which that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. And he was just talking about the love of riches and, you know, the, the love of mammon. And he talks a lot about that in the scriptures also. But how can we not be a stumbling block in a lot of different areas of our lives? Turn to James chapter 4. We just finished up the men's Bible study, the book of James, uh, last Thursday. And we're going to be going into the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, James, a lot of great verses in James. But James chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother, speaks against the law, and judges the law. But if you are a judge of the law, you are not a doer of the law, Amen. but a judge of it. You know, and, I mean, guard your tongue. That's a good way not to be a stumbling block. Because the tongue is like a deadly poison. You know, it, it, uh, it lights a whole forest in fire. Exactly and right. so instead of, of using your tongue as a weapon... Use it as a love's uh, tool. There we go. A love tool. Matthew chapter 22, verse 40. And I'm sure we've all said things that we regretted afterwards. Matthew chapter 22, verse 40. On these two commandments depend the whole law. Of the prophets. What two commandments? Verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor how? Like yourself. As yourself. So we can be a stumbling block in what we say. Careless words. Speaking evil. I mean, we were all created in the image of God. And we're speaking evil about God's creation. So we got to watch our words. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Judging each other. You know, and another way that we stumble in this one, and it applies to a lot of the different stumbling areas, is as teachers at, and with our children. You know, what are we letting our children watch on tv what are we letting them see and in, in uh, videos and, and you know all the different 
video markets that are out there today, you know, that we need to be careful that we are, are what are we teaching them if, by our actions, by our actions? What we're doing, what we're watching, what we're saying. And uh, just to go into number two, I'll come back to this one. James chapter 3, verse 14. James chapter 3, verse 14. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. Wow, you can be a stumbling block by your bitterness, by your selfishness, by your jealousy in our hearts. It can cause other people to stumble. You know, and he says in verse 16, For where jealousy and selfish ambition is, there is disorder, that Satan loves disorder, and every evil thing. So we can be a stumbling block right there in, in you know, by our jealousy and anger and bitterness and resentment and all these other heart things of the heart. Number three, James chapter 5, verse 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Be patient, verse 8. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, we can be stumbling block in that we complain, you, uh, grumble all the time. I mean, Philippians says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. But people see us grumbling and complaining. They go, I don't want anything like that in my life. And we're called Christians. We go to church every Saturday night, every Sunday morning, or, you know, Tuesday night or Wednesday night, or this coming Thursday night is the Spanish uh, Bible study on Thursday night. We have you know, um, Omar, and, and we have Ricardo, and her mom, uh, Omar's mom, that's always praying for Omar and Ricardo. Power of prayer right there, power of pro well, mama. You know, there's all kinds of opportunities, but if they see people that are full of grumbling and complaining, and you know, they don't want to come. They don't want to be part of that. So you can be a stumbling block in that way. You know, James chapter 5, verse 9, we just read it. Do not complain. Philippians, do not be grumbling people. You know, stick to the big picture. Live for the kingdom of God. Lord, Practice loving God and loving others is the way that you want to be loved. Look for his coming. You know, number four, you can be a stumbling block in this area. Chapter 3 of James, verse 13 who among you is wise and understanding, let him show by good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. In the gentleness of wisdom. And, uh, you know, again, in our attitudes, we can be stumbling blocks where there's bitterness and, and strife and self-centeredness. You can be a stumbling block to others. Uh, number five, James chapter 1, verse 19. Notice that these are from the book of James. This you know, James 1, 19, my beloved brethren. So he's talking to us. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and what? Slow to anger. For the, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Put aside, verse 21, all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So by your actions, you can be a stumbling block to other people. And like I said, I mean, somebody's always watching you if you have kids grandkids they're always watching you you know what movies you're looking at what music you're playing and you know how you're stumbling the, you know you can stumble children by what you allow them to watch what you allow them to see places you go what kind of an example are you setting when we get to back to luke 17 he talks about stumbling 
little children. There's going to be a judgment seat for teachers that are stumbling little children in elementary school. Teachers that are stumbling kids in high school. Teachers that are stumbling kids through this vain philosophy and their ideology that's really evil in college. They're going to face a judgment for that. There's going to be a judgment for those that promote abortion. I feel sorry for some of our legislatures because they're going to be judged mightily for the 65 million people that have been aborted. There's going to be a judgment. It, they become stumbling blocks to people in their faith. I mean, so many children, I think, have been stumbled by what their teachers and their ideology uh, that they're teaching, their heresy, really, that they're teaching kids in schools. So right after all this, he says this. Chapter 17, he said to his disciples, stumbling blocks will come, but woe to him through which they will come. Tell the person, woe to you, woe to you. if you're a stumbling block. I just gave you five different areas. Now, look what he says. It would be better for him or for any of us if a millstone were hung around his neck and he or she was thrown into the sea that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. What is a millstone? It grinds wheat and different things. It's a grinder, right? I mean, you know, usually they used them on mules, you know, the, and they grinded the wheat. Can you imagine a hundred pound millstone put around your neck and you were thrown into the sea? It, I mean, these are powerful words. He says in verse 3, be on your guard. I mean, we need to be on our guards every day, don't we? Be on your guards. Take heed to yourselves, he says. And then he says, if your brother sins, sister sins, rebuke him. But if he repents, what are you to do? Forgive him. So God's word is po powerful and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction and what training in righteousness and you know it's good news if you turn someone from their sins i mean we can repent as in we can give god's word out and god's word by the power of the holy spirit will do its work and so you know we get back to god's word again and then it says in verse uh four or verse three now be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, what? Forgive him. Quickly, completely, repeatedly forgive. But if you only knew what kind of person he is, I can't forgive him. I mean, aren't we all thankful that Jesus forgave us? And as he has forgiven us, he says, go and forgive others. Remove those grudges and that bitterness and resentment. I mean, it's hard to do and it takes time, but you need to go to God in prayer. Speak the truth. Correct in love. Forgive. Interesting. I found this out. The rabbis of Jesus' day taught that you forgive three times. You forgive three times for the same sin. But if you did it the fourth time, you don't forgive them. <laughs> Only three times for the same sin. Jesus doubles that number. Interesting. And the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. Yeah, or verse 4, if he sins against you seven times a day, not three times, and returns to you seven times. So he doubles the number of times that they said to forgive and adds one. If he forgives 
seven times, I say, repent and forgive them. And then the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, God. You know, just for good measure, he added one to their double of their amount. We've, and then he says in another passage, he says, forgive 60, what is it, nine, 69 times, time, oh, seven. Now that person sitting next to you may be close to 70. And you're thinking, oh, I'm so glad I'm almost there and I don't need to forgive him anymore. And no, God was using means endlessly. Endlessly. And, uh, I mean, we've been completely forgiven by Jesus. So you can be a stumbling block in just the area of the acid that's filling our hearts and our minds of unforgiveness. And it's eating away at you like cancer. Something that's happened in your past. And it turns you into a different person. So God says, forgive even as God has forgiven you. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another. Well, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, you just hold on to it until you die. No, it says, let it be put away from you, Amen. along with all malice, yes, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, yes, forgiving each other, Hallelujah. just as God in Christ has Amen. forgiven you. Yes, yes. Kindness, forgiveness, it's a safeguard. It's a safeguard for our mental health, yes, our yes. spiritual health, really. Emotional stability as we do these things that God has said in his word. You know, when, when somebody fails, you don't rub it in. You know, if somebody blows it, you don't rub it in. You know, I mean, you show the same forgiveness that Jesus showed from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And... The next verse in Luke chapter 17, we are to encourage great faith in others. Are we encouragers? You know, are, are, we, are we standing behind others in our lives? Family members, you know, people we work with, you know, are, are we teaching obedience to God's word by our actions, by what we say? You know, there's no one in here in this room that is a loser. No one in this room. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, There's amen. no one in this room that is hopeless. Amen. You know, I mean, they will never learn their lessons. No, God can change anybody's heart, right? I mean, a lot of people think, hey, my name is stupid because I was called stupid all my life. You are so stupid. You know? But anything is possible with God. Anything. Amen. God can change anybody's heart. Tell the person next to you, God can change your heart. So back to chapter 17, verse 6. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith like a mustard seed. I mean, a lot of people think a mustard seed is like this big. It's just a little dinky seed. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you'll say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. But which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending the sheep, will say to him when he comes in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say, prepare something for me to eat? Properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk. And, uh, you know, afterwards you will eat and drink. That was a servant. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which he were, was commanded, will he? You know, it's interesting what he's talking about here. 
First of all, anything is possible with God. He, he, to the disciples, he said, or they asked about faith, increase our faith. You know, and, and really, all of us here need our faith to be increased, don't we? Great passage in the Bible when he talks about faith. He says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from what? The word of God. So every time you hear God's word, hopefully you're increasing your faith. Those watching online, all of us here in this room, increase our faith, exercise our faith, unleash our faith, expand our faith, express our faith. And God says we are to be encouragers. You know, and if we're not, if we can't forgive people, then we become a stumbling block to other people. So remember that the whole context here is about stumbling block. You know, we should be telling people, hey, I, I notice that you're growing in your faith. I notice you got a smile on your face. You know, I, I notice that you're always here at church and you got your Bibles and, you know, you're taking notes and, you know, you're learning and growing. And we hear that. You know, when we're at Bible studies during the week on Tuesday night or Wednesday night or Thursday night or Friday or Saturday or Sunday, people are quoting Scripture. I'm going, wow, they know the Scriptures. They've got them memorized. And I want to go, yeah! But then we got to be a doer of the Word and not just a hearer only, right? So... True servants are, are, if you're not a true servant, then you become a stumbling block. And Jesus is highlighting duty here, kind of modeling servanthood. Modeling servanthood. Remember when Jesus was in the upper room and, and nobody washed their feet? Nobody washed anybody's feet as it came in. And so Jesus girded himself like a slave and started to wash their feet. And he says, as I have done this to you, go and do this to others. Model servanthood. Be obedient. Be obedient. There's a passage in the Bible that says, do your work as unto the what? Lord. So we all have assignments from God. Be a true servant. You know, Lord, make me a servant. We sing that song. I love that song. Make me a servant, Lord, serving the king. Serving Jesus. You know, thy will be done. Seeing his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Your heart. So then you get to verse 11, and it kind of changes a little bit here. And I got, I think it's number six on your outline. Verse 11. He says, and it came about while he was on his way to Jerusalem. Now, on his way, what was he on his way to do in Jerusalem? To die for us on the cross, to shed his blood for us on the cross, right? He's on his way to Jerusalem. And he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. I mean, he had a divine appointment in Samaria. And if you were a Jew, if you were going from one place to another, you would not go through, if I'm going to Lakeside, I would not go through El Cajon because it's Samaria. And the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. Now, I live in El Cajon. So you would go around El Cajon. You would go all the way to Rancho San Diego and go that way. Or you would go to Ramona and go that way, but you wouldn't go through El Cajon. That's what they thought about the Samaritans. So here it says, he, ent uh, he was passing through between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, there was met him ten leprous men who stood at a distance. Ten lepers. Lepers were the outcasts of society. Um, you know, they, they lived in their, basically alone from their families and others, you know, because leprosy was a very serious disease and most of them died or 
fingers falling off and their hands falling off and their feet falling off. And if there was a leper that was begging on a street, they would have to yell out, Unclean! Can you imagine what self-image they had? Unclean. Unclean. And uh, so it says that here they were stooding at a distance because they couldn't come close to anybody. And they raised their voice and they said, Jesus, Master, have what? Mercy. Have mercy upon us. Now, they probably heard about all the healings that Jesus had done. I mean, he was constantly doing miracles and proving that he was God in human flesh. And so they, you know, they couldn't return to their families. You know, they, they were basically rotting away from the inside out. And uh, look at this passage. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Here's a great passage from the Old Testament. <clears throat> the book of Isaiah chapter 53. My Bible's falling apart. Pages coming apart in the Bible. I'm losing pages constantly. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 53. It says this. He was despised, verse 3, and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, kind of like the lepers. He was despised. He was not, we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten, smitten of God, af afflicted. But he was pierced through for what? Our transgressions. He was crushed for what? Our iniquities. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon Steve. Of course not. The iniquity of us all to fall where? Upon him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, he, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. Like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his 